so uh, very good evening to uh, all uh, attendees on board and uh, very good morning to professor rahman uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have professor rahman today on a webinar uh, titled uh, energy efficiency in smart buildings through iot sensor integration this is a very niche research topic in the area of uh, the smart grid uh, and the renewable energy distributed renewable energy integration uh, and i know personally uh, the extensive work that uh, professor rahman research group uh, is carrying out in this area uh, very personally as i had a pleasure to spend around 3 months in in, in his lab uh, at ari advanced research institution institute uh, in 2016 so with that uh, uh uh my time i came to learn lot many things about iot for a building energy management so with this uh, very short uh, uh note on the title i am now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce professor saifur rahman uh, so professor saifur rahman is a founding director of advanced research institute at virginia tech usa where he is the joseph r loring professor of electrical and computer engineering he is also he also directs the center for energy and the global environment uh, he is a life fellow of ieee and ieee millennium medal winner he was the president of ieee pes for 2018 and 2019 he was the founding editor in chief of the ieee electric electrification magazine and the ieee transactions on sustainable energy he has published over 140 journal papers and has made over 400 conference and invited presentations in 2006 he served on the ieee board of directors directors as the vice president of publications he is a distinguished lecturer for the ieee pes and has lectured on renewable energy energy efficiency smart grid energy internet blockchain iot sensor integration etc uh, he is the founder of bem control llc a virginia based software company providing building energy management solutions he served as a chair of the us national science foundation advisory committee for international science and engineering from 2010 to 2013 he has conducted several energy efficiency blockchain and sensor integration projects for duke energy tokyo electric power company and us national science foundation and the us department of defense and the us uh, uh, the us uh, department of energy and the state of virginia he has a phd in electrical engineering from virginia tech so with this brief bio sketch of professor saifur rahman i am i am requesting professor rahman to start his webinar presentation over to you professor rahman thank you narayan very much appreciate the kind introduction and welcome from gujarat i guess <laughs> i want to visit your campus some day hopefully not not too far out very long so i will be there see you face to face again after four years now okay let me go share my screen now so everybody can see what i am going to talk about and then we can pick it up from that point on one second share so now my friends and colleagues and students in in india uh, if you look at my title the two things are standing out one is energy efficiency second is iot sensors this is my building block how do i use iot sensor to provide energy efficiency to make a building smart so building may not be smart to begin with i can make it smart i'll tell you why that that happens okay now having said that let me start this issue why i am doing this research in the us 40% of total energy in the us all energy not just uh, electricity coal oil gas so this is important 40% goes to buildings highest in the us one segment buildings or could be could be uh, transportation all of that out of that 90% of the buildings in the us are either small size below 5000 square feet or medium size under 50000 square feet that's the building stock 90% are small 
they cannot afford to spend million dollars to buy a high-end commercial building automation system. That's the issue. So we got a grant from US government five years ago now to develop a low-cost, scalable building automation system. That was the charge we got. And we built it. I'll explain to you today how I did that. Then we have the uh, release date is available. <clears throat> there is a uh, app called Wise Building, the bottom bullet on the screen, W-I-S-E, B-L-D-G. That platform allows you, the user, to control building, heating, cooling, uh, many things to make the building more efficient. I'll give you more details in a few minutes. This is the summary of our work. We built an open architecture platform for building energy efficiency. This is, if you see the orange box on the upper, right hand, uh, upper left hand side, I can go to any building, look at the building IoT devices and offer some sensing control algorithms. What is meant by IoT device in a building? As you know, if you're in a conditioning space or heated space, you'll have a thermostat. Thermostat controls the operation of the air conditioner, temperature setting, fan control. So to me, that thermostat is an IoT device, which I can remotely access. That's the example. Now the applications, the red box on the right-hand side, we are applying this algorithm to three major loads in buildings, heating, ventilation, and conditioning, which is thermostat based, lighting loads, and plug loads. The result is by doing this control, we can improve energy efficiency. What does it mean by energy efficiency? We can run the building with same comfort level using less electricity, <clears throat> as an example. Also, because we can control the kilowatt consumption in real time, we can help to reduce peak load and avoid load shedding. That's the idea. Now, this is my lab. That's what uh, Dr. Naran ha has talked about, has seen that. He visited my lab when he was here. This lab is looking at a floor of a commercial building on your left-hand side of the screen. One floor. On that floor, for test purposes, we have put many kinds of thermostats. You can see CT30 Wi-Fi, uh, Nest thermostat Wi-Fi. We have uh, CT80 Zigbee thermostats, all of that different protocols, Zigbee, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, and so on. Then if you follow this uh, oval-shaped picture from left to right in a counterclockwise fashion, after the bunch of thermostats, I'm showing you VAV controller, the variable aperture volume controller that controls the how much cool air you push in a air-conditioned room. Then I have a rooftop unit controller, mod bus, some Philip Hue lighting, light smart switch, a lighting load controller, a dim ballast, smart plug, different kinds, plug load controller, occupancy sensor, light sensor, uh, power meter back net, power meter mod bus. All of these are protocols, back net, mod bus, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, all of these things are given to us. This is the setup. And we can control this by a small computer. If you focus your attention, the green oval shape at the center of this page, which has gray plastic cover, that contains a Raspberry Pi. It's a small, very small microcomputer. Raspberry Pi is big enough to deal with about 30 devices to control them. The problem is Raspberry Pi is not a industrial computer, so its, its reliability is questionable. So we did that in the lab is fine. Then we began to deploy this in real buildings. We found some errors. Now we have decided to skip the Raspberry Pi part, put all our control data in the cloud. That's my next step. I'll explain to you how that is working. Because you put in the cloud, you have no hardware to fail, no computer to fail. The computer doesn't exist. All these devices you see can talk to the account in the cloud and then get instructions from the cloud what to do. That's the setup now. Before I talk about the cloud, let me talk about this protocol business. We talked about this. We are a university. We don't make any hardware. So all the hardware I showed you in the previous slide is bought from the open market. They come with the <clears throat> vendors, 
manufacturers preferred protocol. You see the list. Ethernet, serial, Zigbee, Wi-Fi, BACnet, Modbus, ACP, OpenADR. This is the set of protocols we experienced by buying hardware from many sources. So this is also shown on the right-hand side of the screen. That was our primary contribution in this work, in this research. We are now able to receive signals from any protocol, convert that to Wi-Fi, and then send the Wi-Fi to my, my modem, in, in my case, or to a, uh, a building-based router. That's, that's all you have to do. So we are able to convert any signal you give me to Wi-Fi. Done. Now, this is the building picture. Now we said we showed you one building on a IIT Gandhinagar campus. You got many buildings. So what do you do? You see, I show here only three buildings. Each building, if you see the list on the lower, lower right hand corner, corner has thermostat, uh, lighting controllers, plug loads, sensor, power meters, water meters, rooftop TV, storage, security camera. All of these are now sending information via the building internet into the cloud account for that building. That means that cloud account has real-time information about the operation of these devices. In that same cloud account, I have my algorithm working. Algorithm pings these devices, get the current status, and based on what you want to do, send them some control signals. That's one building. Similarly, other two buildings have their own account in the cloud. In my case, AWS, Amazon Web Services, that's my cloud. In addition to that, you may know that on the IIT Gandhinagar campus, there is a, what do you call, facility engineer. His job is to make sure all the buildings are operating properly in terms of lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation. Therefore, we give a master account, master account to the facility engineer, which is the box on the upper side of the cloud with a desktop showing on in this picture. That's the controller. That means that engineer can see every building, but every building can see only themselves. That way we can keep the control carefully managed and avoid hacking and, and, and interference. There's a setup. In addition to that, if you see the upper left-hand side of my screen, see the purple box, in that box I'm showing connection to the my cloud. That means I'm also in communication with the power company so that if there is a change of so change of price of electricity that happens for peak load and off-peak load, I can get that information on time, use that to provide different control signals so that I can avoid using too much power during the high price hours. That's the connection for the power company. There's a setup, fine. Then, because of this, I claim we can make any old building smart. I don't have a smart building to begin with. I can make it smart because we can put all this stuff in a building like you see here. All can be added value. Nothing required to be done when the building is being built. In the US, we have about 6.5 million commercial buildings. Out of 6.5 million buildings, more than 90% are older than 10 years. So that is the challenge. How do you go to an existing building and make it smart? That's our focus in this research. Before I give you more details, let me show you, share with you some of our experience in savings of energy from heating, cooling applications and lighting energy savings as well. Our data shows for the buildings we have deployed we can save about 20% of energy on a month-to-month -month basis by controlling the timing and the level of temperature setting in air conditioners. That's one. Second is lighting energy savings. In the US, as many of you may know, lighting is very common. Everything is lit up all day, sometimes in the evening as well. So if you do some control and scheduling, we can save on the average 25% of electricity used for lighting purposes. I'll give you examples in a few minutes. In addition to that, our software algorithm, the wise building platform can provide other benefits. One is improved operations and maintenance. What does it mean? You know, you have a building, air conditioned. Usually the rooftop units are on the roof, obviously. 
and they are left there, they operate nonstop. We don't go up to check what's going on. Sometimes these things break down. Why they break down? As an example, they have the bearing is failing, could be. Maybe bearing is jammed. So it is drawing more current, keeping the motor hot, and after some time it fails. In our case, since we monitor the current draw for every load, every load, every 15 seconds, so if a rooftop air conditioning unit is having difficulty, meaning getting some friction or some, uh, some dirt in the, in the, in the, on the shaft, it is by definition, if you hold the motor shaft, motor runs hot. Why? It draws more current to prevent the torque you are putting in. That's exactly what happens if you have friction. Since we are able to monitor current in almost real time, we'll tell the building engineer, look, this motor number 16 on your roof for building six is drawing more current than normal. That's a signal for him to go up and check what's going on. As a result, he can fix things before they break. That's good o &M practice. Second is occupant satisfaction. In addition to changing or controlling temperature and lighting intensity, we also monitor air quality inside the building. We monitor CO2 concentration, PM 2.5. I know Delhi is a big issue for PM 2.5 and people get sick. Since we monitor these indoor air quality for CO2, PM 2.5, we can give some early warning that this building, this room is getting unhealthy. Example is coming in a few minutes. Now, these are a few of the buildings where we have deployed our solution for building automation in the Virginia, Maryland, Washington, DC area. Fine. This is one example of our application. Old building, classroom building, about four, floor, four floors, garage plus three floors. And this is a good size building, medium size, 25,000 square feet. Monthly energy consumption, electricity that is 15, 15 to 25 megawatt hour per month, roughly. Peak load 61 kilowatt. That's the building. This building is nine, was built in 1947. That means 40, 73 years ago. The old building. But by deploying these sensors, we are able to make it smart, meaning it can be remotely controlled, managed, and help to reduce power consumption one classroom in that same building that you just showed you. This classroom has no windows, it's typical here. What you have done, put many kinds of sensors, one on the upper right hand, the upper right hand side of the screen that is sensing CO2, noise, temperature, also humidity, one sensor. It is a Wi-Fi device, it'll send the data over Wi-Fi network to a control box, which is the box below that called BMOS score. That's my, in this case, the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi can receive Wi-Fi signals. It receives the signal and does something with it. I'll come back to that in a minute. If you want to know more about this box, I have a website called BMOS, B-E-M-O-S-S -S -S, dot O-R-G. Same BMOS spelling here, dot O-R-G. That Website has some algorithm, executable files, my papers, and case studies. If your students are interested to do that, please go to bmos.org and get some data for yourself. I have another example of another website, which is more developed. Come back to that in a few minutes. Now, below the BMOS score box, I have a plug load controller. This classroom has a computer, a printer, and an LCD projector. It's normal in a classroom. All connected to the wall outlet and then never turned out. Class ends at 9.30 p.m. on some weekdays. The LCD projector was used, the computer was used, printer was used, they are left, nobody touches them. All night, all weekend, it's on. We said this is not a good way of spending electricity. So you put a smart plug to which you can connect your loads, which they did. That smart plug is smart because it can be remotely accessed and remotely controlled. I can tell how much power wattage this device is drawing from the plug, from my dashboard. Also, if needed, I will program it so that after 10 p.m. it turns everything off and turn back on 9 a.m. next morning. Good. If you scan to your left 
at the bottom, we have a motion sensor in that classroom as well. What does the motion sensor do? It senses if there is anybody in the classroom. If nobody is there, why keep the AC running at full capacity? Why keep the lights on? So since we are able to tell nobody is there, we'll control the lights and as well as the air conditioning level. Then above that on the left, I have a thermostat. That's a smart thermostat that is new. When you enter the building to check what is there, they had a typical analog thermostat, which you can move the needle by hand to change the temperature. We took it out with a smart thermostat, which is a cloud device or Wi-Fi device, which can talk to the BMOS score box in the same classroom. We're using that thermostat to control the temperature setting, fan uh, control on off auto. We also use it to turn things off as needed. Above that picture on the left side, I have a photograph of the rooftop unit, which is serving this classroom and some parts of that floor. And when measuring the power in real time, as like I said before, for that rooftop unit. Power doesn't mean a watt, it means power, wattage, voltage, frequency, and current. We measure all of these for this load. That's the setup. Now, how is the result? If you look at this picture here, this is a screenshot of my dashboard, which is monitoring this classroom. So I see indoor temperature, indoor humidity, indoor pressure, indoor CO2 concentration, indoor noise, get all of that. In addition, I'm looking at outdoor temperature, outdoor humidity as well, just to keep track of things, fine. Very important is this blue box on the lower right-hand side, which shows me the change of CO2 concentration over time. As you know, the ambient CO2 concentration today globally about 500 parts per million, in that range roughly. So when I come to this graph, you see midnight, one, two o'clock, three o'clock, uh, it's 500. Then as people come to the university, come to classroom areas, slowly goes up to 600, class starts at 7, 6.30 p.m. People come to the classroom, they sit down, they breathe, it slowly goes up, 700, 8, 9, 1100 parts per million by the time the class ends, which is about 9.30 or so. Then they leave the classroom, everybody's gone, nobody's breathing in the room anymore, so the CO2 level goes down slowly by next morning, is normal to 500. That's the setup. What's the problem with this? Problem is, CO2 level is unhealthy. Number is the following. If you are in an enclosed space, enclosed space, where CO2 level concentration more than 750 parts per million, you'll feel uncomfortable, dizzy, kind of sick. That's what happens to us. We are in a class, in an office all day, everything is closed in, working hard, breathing too much CO2. We don't know it, breathing so much extra CO2. We don't know that. Go home and feel tired and tell my family, well, I had a long day at work. I am not feeling very energetic. I'm feeling kind of dizzy. It's not a long day. It's because you breathe too much CO2. How do you solve this problem? Our algorithm has set up to see if and when the CO2 concentration goes over 750 parts per million, the same classroom here will throw more fresh air from the ceiling. More fresh air would dilute the CO2 concentration and make the classroom more comfortable. That's how we solve this problem. It is not a building automation issue. If you go to any big vendor like Johnson Control, Honeywell, Siemens, they don't have this feature. We built it because we, we discovered it by kind of accident and we put that in our algorithm. That is the good point to point out here I said, is an open architecture platform, open architecture, which can add things as you find use for it. We found a use for CO2 level concentration change, we put that in. That's the beauty of our work and you can see more in the beamwatch.org website. Good, that was the CO2 issue. Now let's talk about the energy and power issue. Same classroom building we showed you before. We put six thermostats, six power meters, one lithium ion battery and one environmental sensor. I just showed you the picture. That's the hardware you put in that building. Why six thermostats? The building has three floors, different parts, uh, parts of the building, different air conditioners, we cover all of them. Now look at some data. 
before we started to deploy our solution, I want to have a base case. What is happening in the building before we get in? So we measured, this is 2014 information. We measured the power and energy consumption in that building for three summer months when the AC load is very high and see before why this building was deployed, what was happening? Well, three months we saw 8,340 kilowatt hour consumed by that rooftop unit to keep that the space cool, good. Then we said, fine, we had the reference point now, we waited a couple of years because we had to find similar months, so the outdoor temperature must be the same for us to make a one-to-one -one comparison. 2016 data shows here, same three months, we saw because of our scheduling and temperature setting control, we have brought down the three month consumption from 8,342 to 60,071, 26% saving, pretty good. That's the energy part. Now let's focus on the middle part of the page between the two gray boxes, it shows Temperature profile before wise building demand reduction and after is the green yellow box on the right. So let's do the before part. What does a air conditioner do? You have a thermostat, it checks the temperature real time. As soon as the temperature exceeds your set point, AC comes on. AC begins to cool the room. When the room temperature drops below the set point, AC turns off and cycle continues. This is the picture in the middle. You have the green line, which shows the temperature change every 15 minutes. The blue line shows the power draw by the air conditioner, and the red line shows the set point. The set point is 74 degree Fahrenheit or 23.3 degrees Celsius, that's set point. And without any control from us, without wise building, we measure from one to 5 p.m. Why one to 5 p.m.? That is the peak demand hour here where you're working. So we want to stay away from that peak zone to save money. Anyway, that's the reference. Reference is 74 degree Fahrenheit, energy use 2.72 kilowatt hour, max demand was 3.98 kilowatt because the AC was running, compressor was running, not always, sometimes, fine. Then he said, we want to avoid high power consumption during peak hours, so we will do something about it. What we'll do, we'll raise the set point from 74 to 77 degree Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. The set points raised by about 1.7 degrees. That's it. Then we do more things. We start if at 1 p.m. we turn the AC off and keep it off for four hours, room may got, get too hot. We said, what we can do? We can pre-cool the room from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Pre-cool is done at the time when the power price was still the low price, not the high price beginning at 1 p.m. By pre-cooling the room, we have some more space to heat, allow the heat to build up. You can see here, we pre-cooled to about 71, which is 21 and a half uh, Celsius or yeah, Celsius, and then turn the AC off at 1 p.m. You can tell here the green line, steps, AC is off, fan is on as needed, but not compressor, compressor is off. Temperature creeps up, it expect to creep up. By 5 p.m., it reached 77 degree F or 25 degree C, and I turned the AC back on. That is why from this 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. time zone, there is no blue line, right? There, I mean, no blue, spikes, AC was off. Net result, we have now reduced the energy consumption from 2.7 to 1.4, almost 50%. We reduced the peak demand from 3.98 to 1.5, from 4 to 0.5, huge step decrease. Now we'll be paying much less because our peak demand is less. That's an example of what can be done using our OS building protocol. That was the energy in a heating, cooling situation. Now I'll talk about lighting situation in another office building in Virginia. Okay, this is a working building, a school bus depot where they bring the buses for repair. Fine, on the upper floor, first floor, we have the offices for people who manage this 
school bus depot or activities. Three pictures here. The one in the middle shows the filing cabinet area and a common area. It has a skylight and ceiling lights. Everything is on. On the upper right hand side, I have the staff working area where they have gone to lunch now. Lights are on and some light comes from the windows. Below that on the right hand side is a conference room. Nobody is there. Some light comes from the windows and we also have ceiling lights. So when I go to visit this office, I said, well, you are overlit, meaning during daytime, a lot of light is coming from the sky. So you are already flushed with light. Why keep your uh, artificial light, ceiling lights on? The third, if we turn the ceiling lights off, some parts of the room on the back side could be dark, which you don't like. More importantly, if I turn the light off, people think we're not working, <laughs> we are not here. That's a cultural thing. That's why we keep it on. They have no option to dim it, either on or off. That was the situation before we went in. The picture on the upper right-hand side is the lunch hour. They went to lunch. Nobody bothers turn lights off, lights on. Conference room, no conference happening. Still, people are using the lights. That's what we started to deal with, what we did to solve this issue. We said, fine, we would not turn the lights off because people think you left to work. We'll dim the light, dim to the level that you can see people, you can recognize things, maybe you can read a book in that light. That's the difference, fine. By doing that level of control and scheduling, we were able to save, see the number at the bottom of this page here, about a third of the electricity consumption was saved just by scheduling and dimming. That's the result, which is very impressive. What we did is the following. If you follow this table with me, the column in the middle shows per month for that floor, total energy consumption without dimming, using the rated value of the bulbs. For almost 400 plus every month, kilowatt hour. Once we apply our algorithm, monitor controlled by scheduling and dimming, we bring the number from 400 to 264, from 423 to 278, from 426 to 280. Big saving, about a third, 33, 34%. What we did, you want to know what is the dimming level? Again, from 6.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. before the lights are off, 9 p.m. we turn the lights off. Office area A was dimmed to 50%. By doing 50% dimming, they could see things quite well. Nobody's reading their books, so that is not an issue. Office area B, 45%. Chief, chief's office, which is the, the manager of the, of the office, desk area 60%. Uh, meeting area 50%. Meeting area, you don't need to read much. You just look at the faces and talk, right? That's it, less lighting. Conference on 50% and so on and so forth. This is the algorithm we have built to do that. You might ask the question, well, you put the office area A 50%, what if somebody needs more light? Well, all they have to do, the secretary in that office knows how to do this. The, she goes to her, her computer, and move a light bar on the screen and that's it. No other high-tech control is needed. So that's easy to change if needed. That's a lighting application. Now, totally different application. Again, the example, open architecture platform can accept input from many sources beyond building automation. This is my building where Narana worked some years ago now. We put rooftop solar on this building. I put that to see how the solar output shape, load shape, will or will not match my building load shape. That was the idea. We also put a smart thermostat here, a smart inverter here. That's the building picture, rooftop situation in the summertime. This is winter time. Same building, same thing, same picture, but winter time. Again, it's sunny outside, it's a clear blue sky. From my office, I can see sunshine, but I don't see any power output from my solar. What's the problem? Then I go to the temperature data, I see it's very cold and it must have snowed line night before. We rarely go to the roof and check things. We don't do that for many reasons. So we would not have known unless I saw the temperature data that roof has snow cover. So that's how we find out how to control things. This is a screenshot of my, of my uh, solar control algorithm output. 
Well, on the top, you see DC power, AC power, panel efficiency, inverter efficiency, uh, total efficiency 14%, DC voltage, AC voltage, DC current, AC current, total megawatt hour, array insulation radiation, A to five watts per square meter, wind speed, uh, ambient temperature, module temperature, all that is given to you on your fingertips. Also, you can talk about the, the yellow box at the bottom. You can control the inverter power factor to control the voltage if you want to. That's all built in in this wise building platform. Now, battery. The same building we had deployed the classroom solution. We put a small battery, lithium ion, five kilowatt, 12 kilowatt hours. To see if we can use the battery sometimes to avoid peaking capacity from one to 5 p.m. That is the idea. This is the battery in the garage of the same building. Put it in there. It has some information data. Everything is working fine. Also, the same battery project can be visible from my wise building platform. Same platform. Now the page for the battery management. See so the current status, the state of charge, output power, all that is coming to the same control platform. This is my summary then. Because of the work we have done, we can make any building smart. And we believe because of the day and age of high energy prices, all buildings should be smart buildings so that they can be remotely managed, properly controlled, and make the building more comfortable to work in, not just energy saving like C's, CO2 issue, PM 2.5 issue, issues with humidity, all of that can be handled. So this work is now available commercially if you are interested in this. I would not take any more time to go through the details. There's a website, you see at the bottom of the page, the yellow letter, bemcontrols.com. If you go to their website, you'll see this page, the landing page here. On the upper right-hand side is a green box. If you click in that box, you'll see a video clip of my lab how we do things. I give you some still pictures. Now the video clip will give you lighting control, solar control, cooling control, all that is available if you're interested in. I'll just stop here for now. So now that's my end of the technical talk about 35 minutes or so. Let me take a minute or two to talk about IEEE. We are here because of IEEE to begin with. We are showing you here, right here, this picture. What is happening today. Because of COVID-19, we are homebound, which is a good in some sense, because I cannot talk to people in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, other parts of India without having to travel there. So we are having more cooperation, more collaboration. We're now a big community. But for that to sustain, we have to make IEEE broader, meaning it has to take in many people, offer many opportunities, offer many people to do something under IEEE umbrella. So for that to happen, people like you in the far end, and in Ahmedabad, for example, you got a local section, local chapter of PES, you should feel you are valued. You have a contribution to make. You have somebody up there who can listen to you. That's my motto for my work in IEEE. I want to do that. I, I, I not want, I do this already myself. Nara knows that very well. So if we can allow that to happen, somebody like Naran, Professor Naran can go up and he can be a section chair, could be the India Council chair, could be IEEE vice president for something. It's possible. I want to keep that channel open to everybody from anywhere in the world so they can feel they have a place to be and be heard. So that's what I want to see happening going th forward in the IEEE domain. Finally, this is something that bothers me. Why is that? I go to many meetings in India, for example. I finish my talk, I come down, people talk to me, they give me their business card, their name card. I see many of them are not in IEEE senior member. They are members only. Even though they are qualified, they have industry experience, I ask them why you are not an IEEE senior member. Answer is, sir, it's a lot of work. Why a lot of work? Well, I have to apply online, which I can, but then I got to find three referees who are willing to write, say good things about me. That is not easily available. But I've told many PS chapters now, please publish on your website 
the names of existing senior members. So that's a young lady, she is working for a company for five, six years, should not feel shy anymore. She'll go to the local area chapter website and see the names of the existing senior members. Maybe she knows somebody, maybe one of them is working in her department as a manager or some sort. Then she doesn't have that barrier to keep looking and don't, without knowing where to go. That really helps. Similarly, IWA fellow is a more difficult thing to be, but it's possible. I would like to see more people from India apply to become IEEE fellow who are accomplished persons and use PS IEEE section resources to be visible as much as they can. So that's my end of my talk. This is my last slide reminding all of you, elections have started as of Monday this week. So I'm running for president elect. You probably know that already, but whatever you do, please vote. In IEEE, Voting number only 15% vote, 15% rest don't vote. So I want to see 50, 5, 0, not 1, 5. Make it 50% this year. So you can see we are actively engaged. One more thing, I'm giving you here my email address. If I'm not able to answer all your questions today, please, please email me your question to this address and I'll be happy to send you written apply. So that's about all I have. I am giving you also my website the bottom of the screen, srahman.org. It has PowerPoint and PDF files of my other lectures given in Kerala, in Delhi, in uh, Hyderabad, in Kolkata. If you want to know more, go to their website and learn more. Finally, for the young generation, I am on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. You can find me there as well. With that, I'm going to stop here, Naran, and you take over and run the... Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rahman, for your uh, talk. Uh, it was very informative and a detail in terms of IoT uh, for a building energy uh, uh, management and the uh, uh, building energy efficiency improvement. Thank you very much, Naran. Hope to see you sometime, maybe next year. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Good luck. Good evening. Thank you. Take care. Take care.